Bonsoir, mesdames, messieurs. Bienvenue à l'Université Concordia. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Concordia University. Je suis uh, Graham Carr, vice-recteur à la recherche et aux études supérieures, and it's really my pleasure to uh, welcome you here this evening to the second of four conversations being brought to you uh, over the, literally over the winter and spring um, by the Globe and Mail and Concordia University on the topic of living well and staying healthy. It's good to see so many of you uh, here this evening. We've got a, a full house, so I'm going to seize this opportunity to remind you that there are two more talks coming up in this series in April and May, and that you can register for our next two conversations by going to our website at concordia.ca. The moderator for tonight's conversation is André Picard, the highly respected public health reporter at the Globe and Mail, and one of Canada's top commentators on public policy. As I'm sure many of you know, comme vous savez déjà, André est journaliste spécialisé en santé publique pour le Globe and Mail, et auteur de plusieurs succès de librairie, dont The Gift of Blood, Confronting Canada's Tainted Blood Tragedy. Il est renommé euh, au travers du Canada et à l'extérieur pour son écriture sur un éventail de questions. Veuillez me joindre en accueillant André à nouveau. Tonight, uh, André will moderate a conversation on the obesity crisis that is sweeping North America, and our distinguished conversationalists this evening are Mark Bittman, the food columnist for the New York Times, and Dr. Jennifer McGrath, Associate Professor of Psychology and Director of the Pediatric Public Health Psychology Lab here at Concordia. Allow me to say a few words about our guests. Mark Bittman has been a professional writer about food since 1980. He began writing for the New York Times uh, uh, in 1990, and in late 1988, his breakthrough cookbook, How to Cook Everything, was published, a book that probably changed how a number of uh, kitchens learned to cook everything over time. Other books by Mark have followed with much acclaim and success, particularly Food Matters, in which he argues, among other things, that healthy eating can save the planet. He also blogs on food and is a frequent guest on broadcast television. Jennifer McGrath leads a team that conducts research on early markers during childhood and adolescence that increase the risk for eventual cardiovascular disease. Funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Jennifer's work examines the many factors that contribute to obesity, including shorter sleep duration, the body's response to stress, misperception of risk, inconsistency in daily routines, metabolic changes, and socioeconomic status. And obviously, by identifying these factors, it is possible to develop preventive regimes to address them. These connections between research and the wider world are at the heart of the research mission here at Concordia University, and increasingly, health research focused on primary and secondary prevention is an area we are developing. But finding ways to communicate our research and make it accessible to the public is equally part of our mission, and that's the spirit behind tonight's conversation series. So without further ado, I'll turn the podium over to André and look forward, along with the rest of you, to a great evening. Thank you. So thank you and welcome everyone again to the, the Globe Concordia Speaker Series. Bienvenue ici ce soir, uh, cette belle soirée enneigée. Now, the way it works, I'll explain very briefly, is we're going to sit down here and we're just going to have a chat. It's a conversation. We're going to talk about obesity, but we're going to talk about food more broadly. It'll be fun, it'll be informative, and uh, you'll leave here hungry, I'm sure, for more. Food and otherwise. So, without further ado, let me invite out uh, Mark and Jennifer to take a seat, and we'll get started with our chat.
See, Mark, you're very popular. You got a full house again. Je parle bien français. Absolutely, absolutely. Beaucoup de pratique à lire les menus. Voilà. So, Mark, I want to start. We're going to talk about some serious stuff about obesity, but I want to start with something uh, a little more personal. I, I want to know uh, somebody who knows how to cook everything. Obviously, you wrote you wrote the book literally. What, what do you like to eat, and how do you eat healthy? Oh. Um, I like to eat everything. Um, <laughs> There's really almost nothing that I don't like, and even those foods that I didn't like when I was um, a child, I've somehow learned to like. Um, but they were not exotic foods I never had a problem with. Celery I had a problem with. <laughs> now I like celery. So um, I have this, I'm sure we may get into this later, or we may not, but I, I six years ago, developed a sort of peculiar, well, unusual way of eating, and that is that um, I eat very strictly as a, as a vegan until six o'clock every day, and then I eat whatever I want. So, um, <laughs> so I enjoy this because I'm hungry at breakfast and I eat, I eat vegetables, beans, rice, stuff like that. And then at lunch, by lunch, I'm usually much hungrier, but I eat big salads and things like that. And then at dinner, I start drinking and and don't yeah. stop. <laughs> Last night I had La Samoel and uh, Rognon. So, yeah. you know, it was, it's a very broad palate. Great. So you cook everything and you eat everything. Uh, Great. Sort of, yeah. And are there good foods and bad foods, or is everything okay in moderation? What, what's your philosophy on food? I would have said five years ago everything was okay in moderation. Um, It's, it's still true that almost nothing, I mean, arsenic will kill you if you eat it on the spot, but mo nothing is going to make you sick um, in small amounts. But there are foods that are better than other foods, and there are things that we call foods um, that aren't food at all, like soda or, or pop, as you might say. Um, <laughs> and I think that that division is really, is really becoming more and more clear, that Unprocessed foods, um, for want of a better term, natural foods, single ingredient foods, foods that don't require a label like a head of broccoli or a red pepper or even a chicken are, are much better for us than things that didn't exist 50 or 100 years ago, of which, I mean, the majority of foods in most supermarkets now didn't exist. Our, gram our grandmothers yeah. wouldn't have recognized them. So we'll come back to some of these, this stuff, uh, but I want to draw Jennifer in, and I want to ask you something similar. You're, you're a psychologist. Well, why an interest in food, obesity? Aren't you just worried about what's going on upstairs there? Why, why, why the interest in food? <laughs> um, I'm trained as a health psychologist, and part of my training is in behavioral medicine and in child clinical psychology. So for me, the real interest is thinking about behavior. And as a psychologist, we're in part trained to get people to start changing their behavior. And we know that your lifestyle behaviors are, in fact, some of the biggest predictors of eventual morbidity and mortality. So how do we get people to change their behaviors? And how do we get people to make small changes? And for myself, I do that in terms of obesity and the larger cardiovascular disease, but particularly looking at early risk factors in children. But isn't, isn't eating the most natural thing on Earth? We're, we're born suckling. Uh, why do we need psychologists and health professionals to tell us all this stuff? Do, shouldn't it just be natural? Um, well, I, I guess it could be natural. There's lots of things that are natural, though, right? Um, the key thing about being a psychologist is that we have specialty training in helping people think about how to change these behaviors. But we also have training in some other things like stress, right? And we know that if you're really stressed, you actually crave different foods and you eat differently. So when we start thinking about these psychological phenomenon, and stress is it's in itself is a, a health risk factor, those are the types of things that we look at. So food is nourishment for more than the stomach. It's, uh, there's a lot more to it. Absolutely. Okay, so there's a lot going on up there, upstairs anyhow. That's right. Great. So Mark, let, let's wade into the bit of the more serious stuff, obesity. Uh, you know, the stats, we know all the stats. Uh, in Canada, childhood obesity has tripled in the last generation. States too. Yeah, mm -hmm. about 60% of Canadians are now overweight. It's kind of normal to be overweight. Uh, did, does it get discouraging for you that things are just getting worse and worse? Or do you, do you see some hope there that things will get better? Um, 
the rate of obesity has slowed. The number of calories we eat is slightly down from a couple of years ago, or there's some evidence that says that. Uh, we are eating um, less meat than we were 10 years ago. We're uh, not that meat is directly implicated in obesity, but um, eating more meat is probably not a good thing. Um, and apparently now we're drinking less soda than we were a few years ago, which is a really great thing. I like to think that um, uh, North America set the world standard for bad eating. Um, <laughs> it's kind of true. And if you um, I have a slide, sometimes I give talks with slides, and I have a slide that I like to call the Bittman bell curve of bad behavior. You'd probably appreciate <laughs> that. I'll send it to you. you. Um, so it's an upside down bell curve, and it looks like that, as bell curves do. And I, I sometimes say that we're just about here. <laughs> like, things are not quite as bad as they were five years ago. And that may be wishful thinking. Um, globally, I like to think that other, other countries will see how wrong we've gone and have a much shallower plunge into the depths or wade into the shallows would be really great. Um, but you probably know that um, Canada is not the second most obese country in the world. Uh, Mexico is. Mm -hmm. So um, North America in general is really in rough shape in this, in this regard. And what's, what's the principal driver is this? Is it just too much volume? We just eat too much? Or is it what we eat? Because, you know, I think of my grandparents. My grandparents didn't exactly have a healthy diet. It was meat and potatoes for their 15 children. Not necessarily a lot of it, because they had 15 children. But, you know, it was pretty heavy stuff, a lot of calories. But they also worked hard. So is it volume, lack of activity? Is it because we eat stuff that's unpronounceable chemicals on the, the package name? What, is there one driving force, or is it a whole bunch of things? There's no simple answer. I think um, there, there could be mysterious factors at work that we haven't figured out yet. Um, it, there are things called endocrine disruptors that people believe could, could be a problem. There's, there's a study every day. Today's study that, that would be, might be a part of that answer is that um, children fed carbohydrates at a very young age when, when our ancestors would have all been breastfeeding. Um, now, of course, many kids are being introduced to baby foods and formulas at a very early age, and they're sometimes filled with sugars and carbohydrates, and there's an indication that that may be um, a precursor to obesity later in life. So there's, but that's just, that's today. I mean, that was today's thing. There's something every single day, there's a study that says this is linked to obesity, that's linked to obesity. So it's very hard to know how this is going to shake out. What's clear, what's clear are two things. We're eating something like 20% more calories than we were 30, 40 years ago. That's a big deal. We're more sedentary than we used to be. That's a big deal. And we eat Actually, in 1970, the per capita consumption of North America, in North America of high fructose corn syrup was zero, because it didn't really exist. And now it's about 60 pounds a year. So that's a, that's a huge difference. So, you know, if I had to say what, what we'll know 10 or 20 years from now, I'll, I'll wager that huge amounts of sugar and huge amounts of calories and then, of course, an increasingly sedentary lifestyle are responsible for the, primarily responsible for the obesity epidemic. But really, it could be some completely <laughs> bizarre thing that, you know, it could really be some additive that no one knows about that's sort of, or that we use. But because there are five, I don't know about Canada, but in the States, there are 5,000 additives um, either approved or tolerated in our food supply. 5,000. So how many foods were there 100 years ago? 200, I mean, that were commonly being eaten? So who's to say that one of those isn't somehow bizarrely twisting our genetics or our hormonal, the workings of our hormones or um, enzymes? Or who's to say? Yeah. We'll learn someday, yeah, hopefully. Maybe. Now, Jennifer, you, you do a lot of research on kids, on childhood obesity. That's right. 
is that the key? Is it to resolving this? Is it is it getting them young? Like, are essentially, are we are we poisoning kids with bad habits early? Is that what's fueling this, or is it more complicated? Than that? Um, well, it's it's not that it's ever complicated. It's that it's complex, <laughs> no. right? And I think that's an important point. Um, but what's I think my interest in kids is that we know that a lot of behaviors, as well as obesity in and of itself, tracks into adulthood. So if you're already in a higher risk quartile, say, over the course of time, over through adolescence and young adulthood, you actually maintain being in that high risk quartile. So for me, it seems like a pretty easy thing to be thinking about of how do we start to look at kids earlier. And Part of my interest started when they had done a really interesting study, the Bogalusa Heart Study, actually found evidence of fatty streaks and things like cardiovascular disease precursors in kids that had died from accidents. And when they did autopsies of their heart, they already found evidence for these fatty streaks. So it's not that it takes years of cumulative exposure of these things that start to make us develop obesity or cardiovascular disease, it starts early. So it seems like that would be a really key opportune time to think about how to intervene so that they don't develop these risk factors that go on to later lead to disease. And are there, are there no-go foods for kids? Are there things absolutely shouldn't give your kids? I'm one of those people that wouldn't be hard for us to say there's absolutely no no-go foods. I think that that starts to set up a dynamic where th it becomes like more exciting if then they can have it. So I think instead the key thing is to always teach moderation. And absolutely, maybe moderation of some things more than others. So really limiting sweetened uh, beverages. Um, but as a whole, I think you really want to model for your children. Parents are really, uh, they're agents of change, so they can help, um, you know, set a good course and sort of show what to eat and how to exercise. Now, Mark, when I went to, uh, to prepare, I went to buy your book at the, the bookstore, and it was there with all these diet books. So it was a little island of common sense in a <laughs> ocean of nonsense. <laughs> so is there, so I'm, I'm interested. That's very nice of you to say thank you. <laughs> well, I, in my work, I get a lot of these books at work, and I sadly read some of them. And they, <laughs> there's a lot of disturbing stuff, right, in diet books. So I, I wonder your take on diets. Uh, okay, mine is, you know, of course, you know Michael Pollan well. Uh, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Do we, do we really need to know anything more than that about dieting? Well, but that's, those are two separate questions. Okay. One is what makes sense. Okay, so eat food, not too much, mostly plants is pretty good. Um, you might amend Except that. Except after six. six. Well, <laughs> you eat a lot. I mean, I think the, I think the mostly, I'd add something about sugar. Those are seven words that can't get much more elegant. I'd add something about sugar. But that, that um, we had a great, a great conversation this afternoon with some of um, Jennifer and, and uh, Jennifer's and other people's <laughs> students. Um, and we were, and, um, we were talking about discipline and we were talking about uh, who you are and, and how what you eat reflects who you are. And, reflects your own self-image. And many people actually have a problem with moderation. I mean, this is part of, and, and um, you, can, you can blame those people, or you can say, we've been subjected to the, the greatest marketing barrage in history, because that's what the marketing of hyper-processed food since World War II has really been. And some people, just as with cigarettes, some people have more ability to resist marketing in the first place, and some people have stronger uh, ability to break habits that are difficult to break in other places. Diets are a crutch, and, and any time you, um, anytime you reduce the number of calories in your diet, no matter what you cut out, you have a shot at losing weight. So, you know, Atkins, Wheat Belly, South Beach, this, that, they're all, um, some are more extreme than others, but by, by if I you know if I say to you don't eat carbs for the next year, you'll probably lose weight. If I say to you don't eat meat for the next year, you'll probably lose weight. If you don't eat any sort of calorie dense thing for the next year, and 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 people are looking for answers because you know I, Jennifer can speak to this much more articulately than I can, but it's it's very difficult to say. It's easy to preach moderation, and we all do. It's very difficult to to be moderate when you've had a lifetime of saying 
two double cheeseburgers, fries, and a Coke. I mean, it, it's a, that just sort of slides off the tongue. And, and you are getting cues. Um, you know, if any of you have read David Kessler, our firm, former FDA commissioner's book, or Michael Moss's new book, um, we are getting cues all the time of things that we should be eating that are bad for us. And you somehow have to develop a system to, to fight off those cues. And diet books, you know, I, I won't defend the genre, but each one has a rationale that says, I can help you eat less. And for some people, they work. There's also evidence, well-known evidence, that everybody who loses weight via a, a gimmicky diet eventually gains it back. Because what you need to do is... Um, you do need to retrain the way you, I mean, that's why, you know, this is, that's why I came up with my wacky little diet, and it's worked, I mean, six years later, it's worked for me, um, because I think I was able to sort of develop a new style of eating that worked for me. So, you know, the genre is weird, for sure, <laughs> and I get those books, too, and I mostly put them in a stack, and then at the times we have a place where we put books that, the sales of which go to the needy somehow, yeah. I don't know. And, and they all wind up there, but... And you, but you lost a considerable amount of weight yourself at a certain point. Was that a diet, or was that a change of lifestyle? Well, if How you, do you consider describe? the thing that I described before, I like to say, look, everybody says, my diet is not a diet. <laughs> everybody yeah. says that, because it's much better to... Because I sound so rational now, right? Yeah. So I say... <laughs> You, if you eat vegan before six and then you eat whatever you want, it's not a diet, it's a, it's a new way of life. And for me, it became a, you know, a new style of eating that I can pretty much stick to. So you can call it a diet or you can call it not a diet. I mean, diet, the original Latin diet, meant what we would call lifestyle. It didn't mean, yeah. here's how I eat. It meant, here's how I live. Okay. And Jennifer... Do diets work for people? Is there something motivating about them, or is it the opposite? Most diets don't work. Um, there's good evidence to show that while you may lose a small amount of weight over, say, the first six months, odds are four years later, not only have you gained back the weight that you lost, you've put on more weight. So the idea of having time-limited uh, diets that are restrictive, they usually do not work in the long term. Um, the, the best diet are the diets that you don't even realize that you're on, that you really start to integrate into your daily behavior, that you start to shift your beliefs. Um, those are the ones that typically work best. But are there, are there tricks, psychological tricks, that can help you change your lifestyle, or is it just hard work? It's hard work. It's hard work. It well, really we is. we don't like that answer. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> there, yeah. So healthy living is hard. Healthy, you have to make choices. You have to make choices on a daily basis. You have to do that in the face of absolutely things like marketing and being told um, you know, what's healthy for you. And you wonder, well, what is healthy? And then you have conflicting scientific results. That could be confusing too, right? And sometimes it's just easier to go pick up something rather than to make it yourself. So it's all those kinds of barriers that you'd really have to go up against to start adjusting and make this part of your lifestyle. But, you know, we, to be more serious, we don't like to, you know, we don't say that often enough. Yeah, it takes effort. It takes work, and there's a reward to it. A healthier heart, a healthier mind, et cetera, but you have to work for it. The rewards sometimes aren't immediate, and so that can make it more difficult, too, right? That in the long run, there would be uh, more gains met. And so if you can see that and you can look forward to that, it, it works in the long run. Can I ask Jennifer a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about this this afternoon, but it's, it's a question. Well, here it is. So I said this thing about how diet and exercise are very similar because they're both disciplines and you can fall off the wagon, but you have to get back on the wagon and, and so on. And exercise is also hard work and there's reward and blah, blah, blah. What is the, is the, is the neuro mechanism for both similar? Is the discipline similar, similar the reward similar? Is, is there a... If you can exercise, can you eat better? Um, I wouldn't approach that answer from a neuro perspective, in part because I'm not a neuroscientist. But I do think from a behavioral perspective it is. We would use very similar techniques to encourage people to think about how to move from a, a place where they don't even recognize that their uh, typical behaviors are problematic 
to starting to have them think about, maybe I could change one of them, or maybe I should start to think about changing one of them. And then we work to motivate people to think about, OK, what could you realistically do? And what could you start to incorporate? Having them really recognize how to embrace even small changes. Um, and that would apply no matter what the behavior is, be it for eating, be it for increasing their physical activity. And the other half that I always like to make sure people re remember is decreasing sedentary behavior, because sedentary behavior and physical activity really are actually separate phenomenons. So those types of principles apply to all sorts of behaviors. But some interesting parts of your research are exactly that, that uh, kids don't always recognize, even when they're overweight or obese, they don't see themselves as that, and their parents don't necessarily see them as that. So they, they can't change, right? They don't know that there's anything wrong. Yeah, so the one study that you're referring to that we did um, was our misperception study. And this was the study where we had kids and we actually had their measured height and weight, so we knew how obese they were. And we had them look at a picture of silhouettes, so the skinniest silhouette to a silhouette that was obese. And we asked them to pick the silhouette that they thought was most like them. And first off, across the board, kids always picked a silhouette that was smaller than what they were, which is not at all unexpected. We know for a fact that in general, Whenever you have people report their, their level of obesity, we always underreport it. We always say we're taller than we are, and we always say we're slimmer than, than we are. Well, men say they're taller, women say they're slimmer. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so, but when you compare measured data versus self-report, the self-report is always showing lower obesity rates. So what was interesting about this study with the kids is that, yes, they were picking the smaller silhouettes. But what we did was look to see if those that are around them, how big they are, influence the kids' rating of themselves. And that's what was the most interesting part about the study. Kids that were surrounded at their schools by kids that were bigger, so just in general had a higher rate of overweight or obesity, tend to pick more average silhouettes. So it's this idea that it's a, there's something that's relative about it. That if you don't see yourself as being that big, because maybe all the people around you, you're average, that starts to be of concern for me um, as an epidemiologist, someone that does psychology of, if we don't recognize there's a problem, I, I can never get you then to start trying to shift, shift your lifestyle behaviors. So I think that that's key. And when we work with parents, it's, it's really unfortunate that a lot of times parents, they don't want their kids to be obese. They also really don't want to have any uh, sadness or depression or self-esteem issues related to that. But a lot of times parents more often will say, my kid's big bones. There's not that many people out there that are big bones, right? Like, we have an obesity epidemic. Um, and people are often afraid of having eating disorders. I looked today. The prevalence of eating disorders is between 0.5 and 1%. It is so low, and in males it's even lower, 0.1 to 0.3. It's such a low percent that I'm, I'm not, I feel like that's not really the way that I, I want to think about this when I think that we have 30% of kids, 27 to 29% of kids that are overweight or obese. We have a serious epidemic of childhood obesity. Uh, Mark, uh, Jennifer said a word I like, misperception. So I'm, there's a, I think one of the biggest misperceptions with obesity is it's all an individual problem. And I, I think it's fair to say over the years you've written more and more about this, about the role of, of governments and of, of corporations. I wondered if you could talk a bit about that. Uh, you know, beyond the individual dealing with their, the way they eat, it, it's hard to eat healthy, right? Because of all this pressure from the outside. Well, and it's deliberate. It's, it's about availability. It's about marketing. Um, and it's about habit. And, and uh, the parallel between especially... Um, sugary beverages, which have, have, well, I wouldn't define as food. I would define as non-food, but they have no nutritional value. Many people call them empty calories, but I think if something is damaging, that's worse than, that's worse than empty. Um, and they don't quench hunger. When you, when you drink a sugary beverage, you don't eat less. So these are damaging calories that you're taking in that you don't need and don't do you any good. Well, obviously, if they're damaging, they don't do any good. But um, all, of that, all of that combines to make for a very dangerous situation. And, and I think that the parallels between that and tobacco, while there will, there will never be a smoking gun um, that's as strong as the smoking gun between tobacco, cigarette smoking, and lung cancer, there is a lot of very, very strong evidence that um, 
high levels of sugar will cause obesity, metabol what's called metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and so on. So um, who, do we, who do we blame for that? And, um, I, you know, when I was young, everybody smoked cigarettes. I mean, <laughs> literally three quarters of the people on my college campus smoked cigarettes, and no one accused us of being um, dumb or weak-minded or weak-willed because that was, it was a habit. I mean, it was obviously also nicotine is addictive. I mean, really addictive. Um, I think the parallel between that and, and overeating and obesity and especially overeating of junk food um, and hyper-processed food is really, really strong. And I think uh, we're talking about marketing and we're talking about habits. We're talking about availability. We're talking about what's marketed to children um, and what habits are developed in, in youth. And I think uh, certainly we have, there is personal responsibility and some of us are, are better than others at, at regulating our diet. But, but the onus really lies on, I, I think, the manufacturers, the marketers, and the government to produce better products, to push less, especially um, these kind of products to children, and on the government's part, to regulate this, to limit the sale of junk food and soda to kids. And you, you've written some very powerful columns about the, uh, the Bloomberg Initiative in New York about limiting size of of soda servings. Uh, were you disappointed the way that turned out with the court? Uh, it's certainly not over, but uh, it was struck a blow by the courts recently, that whole initiative. We say pop here, we don't say okay. soda. Um, I was trying to make you feel at home. <laughs> I was disappointed, but um, you know, I was disappointed there was an initiative, and there were initiatives in two towns on the West Coast this fall, uh, Richmond, which is outside of San Francisco, and El Monte, which is outside of LA both to have fairly, fairly strong soda taxes um, in their communities, and they both lost. So I was disappointed then also, but you know, the publicity, the consciousness that, that got raised as a result of those struggles and the, and the struggle in New York is, is really important. So this is, a, this is a, in a way, it's like our own individual diets. This is, a, this is progress, this is a progression. We are trying to get from one place to another. And whether we get there more quickly or more slowly, I can't say, but I think it's probably safe to say that we will get there. So yeah, it's a, it's a defeat, but it's not a, you know, bat, it's a battle war thing. Okay. But it's, it's mind boggling when I go to the States and I see, I don't think we're quite as bad here. I've never seen the 72 ounce super big gulp in Canada. I think we limit ourselves to around, a liter or so, but no I, I haven't seen the bucket yet. But uh, it, how did we get to a place where somebody actually thinks that's something they need to drink? Um, well, one of the reasons that the the Big Gulp ban makes so much sense is that the default size of sodas in some places, movie theaters especially, and I bet you do have this oh, yeah, here, yeah. Um, is 32 ounces. And those of anyone here who's as old as I am remember seven ounce Cokes in bottles. So the, this guy, Brian, um, Brian Wansink, who studies portion size and all kinds of tricky, very, very cute and um, easily understood studies about food. He's in, at Cornell. Um, you know, he's basically found that whatever the serving size is, that's what you'll eat. So if I give you a plate of food this big, you'll eat it. And if I give you a plate <laughs> of food this big, you'll eat that. And you'll be full at the end. I mean, this is a very oversimplification, but you'll be full at the end of either of those experiences. If I give you a seven ounce Coke, you'll think, that's really nice. I have a seven ounce <laughs> Coke. Well, not anymore, of course, but in the old days. You'll think you're ripping me off. Right. <laughs> so they made the, the default size of a Coke is now, well, the default size is kind of 20 ounces in a bottle and in a cup at the store at, at McDonald's or whatever, the default size is probably also 20 or 24 ounces. And in a movie theater, it's 32 ounces. 32 ounces is four and a half times a set. It's like drinking four and a half bottles when I was a kid. And kids drink that. So of course there's a difference. Yeah. And we hear uh, to be Canadian, 591 milliliters is our standard <laughs> size so, for what that's worth. There you go. Now, what we're hearing, Jennifer, is, you know, when you talk about portion size and stuff, that's all about modeling. 
So mm -hmm. modeling is important, right? If uh, a lot of parents in the audience, modeling for your kids is probably the single best thing you can do, right? Show them what's normal. That's right. Um, uh, the, the study that you mentioned is a fabulous study, the bottomless bowls that was done. And what was amazing is that not only does it does how much you eat differ depending on the portion you get, if you don't realize that the portion is decreasing, and so this, the study that was so cool was he literally gave people uh, bowls of soup, and four of you are sitting at a table, and two of you don't realize this, but there's a pipe under the table that is constantly refilling the bowl, so it's always maintaining a level no matter how much you eat. I think that's called heaven. It's, yeah. I guess. Because <laughs> it depends on what you're eating. Yes, um, I had a dream like that right. once. <laughs> so uh, the people overate by 75%, and what was even better is when they asked them to raise about how much they thought they ate, they, they even perceive it to be less. So people are often overestimating their portion sizes. And I had an undergraduate that did this really great project that actually simply took some food out and asked the kids to put it into the bowl that A, was just to copy what they saw, and then what they would typically eat. And not only were the kids bad, the research assistants, we all were bad at simply copying portion size. We really have this idea of a portion distortion um, that you know, you go to restaurants and the portions are huge. And so if you're going home and you're eating at home and on goes the plate of a huge amount of food, that's what you start to look at and see and think that's what a normal portion size is. So I think as parents and as role models, we can start thinking about how do we do a better job of modeling and showing like what an average portion size would be. It does mean that a little bit tedious until you get it down, maybe actually having to measure. Um, but after a while, you could probably start to visualize it after you've been sort of seeing it as much smaller portion. But what do you what do you do? Do you buy smaller plates, or is that you know practical? Things you know what? Like if that? you want a practical solution, I'd say buy smaller plates. Well, yeah. there's another yeah. practical solution, yeah. and that is to cook. <laughs> right. And and <laughs> if um, if you go shopping and you say, well, what I want my family of four to wind up eating is one pound of this meat, and you buy one pound of this meat. You That's don't right. buy two pounds of the meat, right. and then you're already way ahead of where you'd be in a restaurant where they're offering you a 16 ounce steak per person. Mm -hmm. But isn't, that's probably the single easiest thing you can do to improve your lifestyle is just cook your own food, right? Well, it's the single simplest solution, but there's a difference between simple and easy. You have to have the time to shop, you have to have the skill to cook, you have to have the time to cook, you have to have the will to cook. So if you consider all of those things easy, no problem. Now Many people would, not. Now is lifting the little plastic wrap and pressing start, is that cooking? I have to tell you something really <laughs> depressing. In the United States, um, it's said that 50% of meals are eaten outside of the home. But if you go to the store and you buy a microwave pizza, a bag of chips, a half of a chocolate cake, just for instance, and a bottle of pop, and you take that stuff home, and you put the pizza in the microwave and press the button, that's a meal cooked at home. So 50% of meals are eaten out of the home, but what percent of meals are cooked from scratch? I think at this point it's 10%, maybe 20 at the most. But haven't we, to come back to the responsibility of society at large, haven't we brought that on ourselves, uh, a lot of that on ourselves? Like, you know, my kids are in high school, they don't have simple things like home economics anymore. That was probably one of the most useful courses in high school. We, we just don't teach kids how to cook, for example. Really simple things. Well, I, I think I said at some point during today's events that it, at, at some stage in every one of these conversations, the question turns to education. Yep. And the question of education is a question of funding. So if you're asking me if I believe in more money for education, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> You can't go wrong. You but can't it, go wrong by teaching your kids more. Yeah. But you have to decide what you want to teach them to. If it's just this reading, writing, arithmetic, we want good scores, and we don't teach you practical living skills, uh, you know, what use is having a 300-pound genius who's going to die at 30? Well, I, you know, I would, <laughs> I would argue that... Um, yeah, I would argue that academics are important, and I would argue that music and art is really important also, which, which are two other areas where funding has been cut. But um, look, we, there's a way in which we've made progress. When I was a kid, we did have what well, we called it home economics. Yeah. 
only the boys went to shop. And so <laughs> to, my, to my learn friend, to make big bowls with fill themselves automatically. <laughs> my friend Ken has both the chair, the little chair, and the little tin bank that we made in shop when I was in eighth grade. So that's really cool. He's a brain surgeon. He didn't need that stuff. But then the girls went off and learned how to cook. So in a way, there's progress because there isn't that kind of, you know, I think one of the things that went awry in the 70s is that men were still too stigmatized to start cooking while women were entering the workforce. So now we're sort of at no one cooks. We're at ground zero. <laughs> no one cooks. But it's not a stigma anymore no. for men to cook. So maybe we come out of this with men and women sharing that responsibility. That would be a really good thing. So no one cooks as a... <laughs> but no the one, women are clapping. Yeah. <laughs> but no one, no one cooks as a bit sad uh, testament to gender equality, I would have to say. <laughs> well, um, you know, to get into the sociology of how, of how women entered the workforce and the American family sort of, and certainly cooking, took a dive, is, that's a very long and different discussion, I think. Yep. But we, many of us were witness to this. I don't think you can deny it. And I don't think you can deny that many people today who are in their um, 20s, 30s, and 40s grew up in homes where there was not a lot of cooking. Mm -hmm. So is there more cooking now? It sort of goes back to my little bell curve where I say, yes, it's slightly better. But it's kind of anecdotal. I, don't, I can't tell you a study that says people in North America are cooking more. And Jennifer, to stay on the, the interesting topic of gender, is there somebody who has more influence on, you know, we kind of assume the woman has more influence on food habits of the family, but uh, is it or is it the modeling of the father eating the second helping of potatoes? What, how does the family dynamic work in, in this? Um, I don't know of research maybe out there that I just don't know of um, that shows if it was one particular parent over the other. Some studies suggest that same sex um, can matter, but I think ultimately, regardless if it's the mother or the father, um, kids, you know, have they, they know they do some things with one parent and some things with another. But as long as that modeling is, is occurring with either parent or in single parent households or in other sort of dynamics, I think what's key, the bottom line, is the modeling, right? And sort of setting that example and showing them, uh, you know, the, the healthy eating, cooking, or doing physical activity. And I wanted to ask you before I forget, before we run out of time, uh, your most recent research that I was reading. Uh, some things are, are unusual uh, factors or some things we wouldn't expect. So you've uh, done some stuff about sleep. Yeah. So sleep affects obesity. And I saw, in fact, a paper published today on that very topic that the less the sleep, the easier it is to put on weight. That's right. Uh, talk a little bit about that mechanism and things that we don't always assume are going to influence our, our weight. Yeah, I think what's really key is that obesity is really multifactorial. I mean, there's a lot of things that are contributing to why we are an obese society. Um, over the course of the last few decades, uh, yes, we've been getting more obese. The number of calories that we've been taking in has been increasing. The number of sweetened beverages that we've been taking have increased. The thing that's actually has mirrored that is the amount of sleep we've been getting has declined. And so that's a lot of the research that we're doing now that we're looking at. Because what's interesting to me is that when you sleep less, it actually triggers your appetitive hormones. So the hormones that drive your appetite and your hunger levels change based on sleeping less. It also screws up your glucose homeostasis, which puts you at greater risk for insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. And what's interesting to me, not only does it make you more hungry, it makes you hungry for certain things. And you could guess what they are. Things that are laden with more sugar, more salt, and more fat. And so for me, that's really been an interesting thing to think about that. And the last part of the peep, the puzzle, is related to stress. And that when you have less sleep, it actually triggers your body's stress response system. And we know that when people are more stressed, be it just from ge general daily psychological stressors and things that are happening, the daily hassles in your life, or because of sleeping less, you're triggering the mechanisms that cause your body to have a stress response, which also puts you at greater risk for obesity and things like metabolic syndrome. So Mark, that may be your missing piece of the puzzle, sleep. I know it's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're svelte, though. Now, before I forget, I want to ask. That wasn't sarcastic. He is svelte. I, he's a marathon runner. They thought runner. you said That's right. 
Stout, no, I said svelte, svelte. Uh, and before I forget, Mark, I want to ask you too. I, I mentioned your books that you've written and everybody has how to cook everything. I hope if they don't, they better buy a copy tonight. Uh, but you have another book coming out and it's about kids and it's about kids being vegan. And I, I want to know, should, is that the solution? Should we just feed our kids a, a vegan diet, set them up for, for a healthier lifestyle and then let them make choices, good or bad, later in life? What, how should we, we help out the kids? Um, I'm sorry to have to correct you. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, I don't mind. <laughs> um, the book I have is actually about my diet, this vegan before okay, 6 p.m. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Which, um, oh, it's before 6 p.m., and I thought it was about before 6 oh, years so old. bad title. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> or a journalist. Could change the title. <laughs> or a journalist who doesn't read beyond the title could be the problem. I don't know. There you go. <laughs> um, as I said, I do think we all, we all need to find... Um, some kind of path to eat better. That's true. This is what's worked for me. I think it might work for other people or I wouldn't have bothered to write this book. But um, uh, I have friends who um, eat very strictly during the week and then go crazy on weekends. I have friends who do the other way around. I have friends who <laughs> have, become, uh, have become vegan for months at a time and then go, I mean, it, you can do whatever you want. The point is, for most people, it makes sense to, to do that pollen thing. You know, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And the question is, how do you find the strategy that works in your own life to do that? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's a lot of this stuff. We wouldn't be studying this so hard. There wouldn't be so many people making a living looking at this and talking about it if it were easy. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do you find what works for you to get you to lead, you know, <laughs> it's because of the corniest two words in the English language, a healthy lifestyle. But it's real. Yeah. But the practice is a lot more difficult than the theory. Well, the theory, you can come at it from any number of ways. I wouldn't be discouraging it about the practice because um, you know, if you change one meal a day, you've changed your diet by 35%. That's a big deal. If you change one meal a week, even, you've changed your diet by 5% which is progress, and I think that's the important thing, is to see progress in your life. It doesn't have to be a dramatic change overnight. I you can think do a little we bit all know that the yeah. black and white stuff does not work. Mm -hmm. And I want to invite people to come up to the mic. We're blinded up here, so you may be at the mics already, but uh, we're going to try and get some questions in, in a second. But the last one I want to ask you, and I, I should have warned you about this earlier, but uh, it just popped out into my mind because last night The Biggest Loser had its finale. Mm -hmm. So. I won't ask you who won because I don't remember, but uh, what do you think about things like that? Good or bad? Are they helpful, this uh, almost food pornography on, on primetime TV? Is that, is that useful or is that discouraging people? I'll, I'll start with the psychologist. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I don't have an answer for that. I don't watch it and I, yeah, I don't, it's, yeah. So, <laughs> sorry. I would say from the point of view that it increases awareness, it's good. Now, is the Biggest Loser show good, or is what they're doing good? I won't, I won't judge that. But I think anything that we can do to help people shift to recognizing, or even looking at them saying, I could do that, that's, that's something. As a psychologist, particularly trying to get you to shift your behaviors and to try to adopt some of these things. Except the whole thing about the Biggest Loser is they go on these ridiculous crash diets. They do everything they can. Right. I'm sure they take meth or whatever yeah. it is. And, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You're going to lose 80 pounds? This is not a strategy for life, you know? But all of these things that we can do in the public eye, right? even the idea that originally, right, New Yorkers were really against the idea of having that ban. And now, after it didn't go through, there's a lot that are coming back around. So I think these are all small ways and small examples of how we can start to get to have public opinion shift. Because I think that in order for us to address this obesity epidemic, right, we have to have individual level things. We need to have public policy and community and society level things. And individuals can start to drive that. And so if this is going to help increase awareness, and I, I completely agree. It's not the technique per se. I definitely don't agree with crash diets. But if we can just start to encourage people to think about and recognize like we need to do something and we need to take ownership of this and we need to make our opinion loud enough to change policy, that I'm all for. I just get a sense of a, you know, you see someone who has to be on an 800 calorie diet and spend six hours in the gym every day. That's not really 
encouraging to someone sitting at home in front of the TV with a big bowl of popcorn and Coke, I don't think, but <laughs> that's my view. Now, I think somebody's at the mic, so uh, we'll invite you to ask some questions. You have some great resources here, so ask them some tough questions and hopefully not long speeches if we have a few minutes, but uh, so. I think it's over here. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so we'll start there and we'll work our way across. Yes? In thinking about child psychology and the barrage of marketing about dieting, I wonder how do we teach kids about healthy eating and also body positivity, especially in a culture where there's so much emphasis on feeling ashamed of the bodies we have in favor for bodies that are often unattainable? That must be for well, me. That, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I know it's like... <laughs> Um, I think it goes back to some of the things that we were talking about that I think what's really key is about modeling. Um, so parents as an agent of change. We also have done some work to show that people that are role models, maybe not your parents per se, but having a coach or an aunt or uncle or an older sibling can also play a big role. So those are the kinds of people that are going to do modeling in terms of your lifestyle behaviors, but also exactly what you're saying about your self-image or how you feel about your body. Um, that's probably the best way to address that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my name is James McIntosh. I'm a professor of economics here, and I'm an obesity researcher. Uh, not for all that long, but one of the things that I've noticed is that there seems to be a woeful disregard by central government on this problem. Uh, governments do not seem to want to take the initiative here, and I was wondering if you had any suggestions as to uh, how we could make a change here. Um, yeah, I'm with you there, um, <laughs> and and um, I guess I see my my personal role as hounding hounding the government as much as I can in the states. I I think um, as individuals, we need to concentrate on the old think think globally, act locally thing, and work in our municipalities to the extent that we can. Um, because I think we have more power on a local level than we do on a federal level. So that might mean being the first major city in North America to tax soda. Or it, for many people, I think what it means is if you have kids, you work in the school system and work not only with the local, uh, not only with the people providing lunch in the school, but you work with the principals and the Board of Education. It's really a starting small, I, I, I fear that it's a starting small situation because in the states at least, the FDA, the USDA, the Surgeon General's office, and even the sort of well-intentioned Michelle Obama are pretty much, and the House of Representatives and the Senate for that matter, pretty much under the thumb of the big food company. So we'd have to make a lot more noise than we're making now to get some kind of response. I think there's a question over there. I'm not, there's no light over there, but is there somebody? No? Okay. Well, we'll go back here. Sorry. Hi. Yeah. I just had a question. You talked about the soda ban before, and I was wondering, do you think it's the government's role to really treat consumers as kids by banning whatever is available, or to just, like, they should just go up to the multinationals and actually, like, leverage their power there, even though I know multinationals like Nestle and even General Mills or anything have like a lot of power? Do you think it's their role to, yeah, to treat people as kids or like to actually go and treat people as adults where they have power? Well, I think that's been tried and I don't think it's working. So um, if there's got to be freedom for everybody, I agree. But if the freedom, if your freedom is poisoning my kids, if your freedom to market is poisoning my kids, I think that my, my freedom to limit your freedom is legitimate. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> well put, huh? That's yes, right. I've never said that before. <laughs> Hi. Got to um, go write it down there. <laughs> um, so we, we know that there's an obesity epidemic, but we also know that that epidemic isn't evenly distributed across a population. And certain groups have worse problems than others. In the United States, uh, among African American communities, and in Canada in particular, uh, among our First Nation communities. Why are some groups hit harder than others with this problem? We know that there's a socioeconomic gradient associated with obesity. 
So people that live in lower SES neighborhoods, and by SES I mean the levels of income, the levels of unemployment, the number of people that are below the poverty line, they in fact have across the board poorer health, obesity as well as a number of other health conditions. And so there are a number of uh, studies that have been done to try to look at what that might be about. And that too is multifactorial. So there are things like simply having access to safer spaces to exercise. Uh, we talk about the built environment or green spaces. There's evidence that they have less accessibility to fresh fruits and vegetables, that the most convenient foods are in fact fast food, and in fact that fast food is more dense in those poorer neighborhoods. We know the rate of um, obesity in children right now is about 27 to 29% across all of Canada. In Aboriginal youth, it's 41%. So it is astounding. And so these are some of the things that we've looked at that we can see these differences. And what, what I also think is really interesting, there's evidence to say that what better predicts the socioeconomic gradient across countries is not the GDP of the countries, it's the amount of income inequality within those countries. So countries where there is a greater spread, so we talk all about that 1%, well, when there's less spread, there's actually less risk of obesity in those countries. And so for me, this drives that, going back to that question about what it is about neighborhood and how much differences there are between different types of neighborhoods when you have less inequality. So, it's absolutely the case that we have certain groups that are more at risk for obesity as well as other diseases, and these are, these are precisely the reasons why. Great question. So in short, poverty, poverty is? I don't like to say the word poverty because it has a lot of uh, very specific meaning and it usually means types of things like cutoff. And why I also don't like to use the word poverty is because for every increment in your socioeconomic status, you can affect your health. It's a gradient. So it's not like you meet some threshold and then all of a sudden your health is poor. It's a real continuum. Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, so uh, my question has already in part been answered. I was wondering about the increasing role of lobbyists like General Mills, Nestle, uh, Kraft Foods, um, and how they're seemingly adopting tobacco, um, ta like uh, tobacco lobbyist tactics in order to work with government to say, well, we can help you solve this problem. How do you feel? Do you think that that will work, um, because I know that a lot of public health uh, epidemiologists, et cetera, are vehemently against it, but it, it seems that they're really powerful. So what do you think? Like, Do you think that it's going to, um, as governments are trying to figure out, should we subsidize broccoli instead of corn? Or? Um, it's worked so far. It's working great now. Um, and, that, and that's part of the problem. You know, it's going to be very hard to have an act, to have government take an active, an activist role in fighting corporations. Um, that's not, I mean, I really know almost nothing about Canada's politics, so forgive me. I'm speaking about the states here. Um, but it doesn't seem that different here. Um, so it's, it's working great, and the, the lobbying is working great, and the co-optation is working great, and the, and the fake cooperation is working great, and the denialism is working great. Um, it's all working great. So what is, what's going to happen is, um, I don't know, because in the States, our, our agencies and our government um, seem unwilling and unable to make any changes in this. So that's why I think the municipal level for most people is the place to fight this stuff right now. And of course, also, you know, as we just spent 45 minutes talking about, the personal level. I mean, we all, it, it doesn't mean it's easy, but we're all responsible for our own health at some point. And if we understand these things, we can make better decisions. But I, you know, I, I, I'm fine saying that, but I, I'm, it's really important to recognize that we are being trained and we are being, in a way, victimized by um, the development of food products that are habit-forming, semi-addictive, craveable, and we're being marketed to death with those products. 
And Mark, say, say a couple of words, because it's related about this uh, Coca-Cola obesity initiative, because I know you, you wrote a little bit about it, these ads uh, they had about obesity. Well, I think, you know, this is, um, this is a the gr take great issue with Michelle Obama on this stuff, who came out in, in the president's first term, came out great guns, she was going to fight the good fight, and now um, there's, a, there's a kind of co-opted spirit to this, you know, we all know that it's calories in, calories out, and if you exercise, you're more likely or you're less likely to be obese. You're more likely to have a healthy lifestyle. But, you know, as I said, I said to someone this afternoon, no one is against exercise. You will not find anyone arguing against exercise. Um, and no one stands to lose money if we all exercise. So Pepsi and Coke and General Mills and Kraft and all those people, they're fine with telling you to exercise because if you eat 4,000 calories a day and you run, what, 10 miles a day, you're fine. <laughs> you're totally fine. So they're totally into the exercise thing is great. What they don't want you to do is eat less than 4,000 calories a day because that costs them money. I want you to exercise and then drink a Gatorade. That's what they want. Yeah, even that. Hi, good evening. Uh, could you comment on organic versus non-organic? And my question is twofold. So first, if we can trust that the food that says it's organic is, <laughs> is it better? And then secondly, can we trust that what we purchase that says organic really is? Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's three questions. Because the first question is really, is it worth buying organic food if it's organic food, right? And the answer is if you can afford it. I mean, to me, um, the question is really not whether you eat an organic cheeseburger or a non-organic <laughs> cheeseburger. The question is whether you eat a cheeseburger or a salad. Um, so that's really the important question. So that, I think organic food and local food are really great. I don't tell people that those are the highest priorities. I don't. Are organic foods really organic? Well, the organic foods from my garden are really organic. Um, the organic foods from some places are really organic. The definition of organic is a little weak. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of a tough thing to answer. But for the most part, I think, you know, this I do know about Canada. You have a really bad testing program, non-existent testing program for organic. So, um, here, it's probably even more questionable. In the States, I think most people, most organic foods meet the standards, but the standards are not that, are not that strict. And then, is what's labeled really meeting those <laughs> standards? I don't know. Hard to know. As you know. Would you buy organic asparagus from Peru in February? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, do you care if it's organic? It's just, the whole thing is crazy, so. <laughs> organic, you know, organic frozen peas from China. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Hi, I'm actually from the U.S. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, the topic has come up a lot about comparing the obesity crisis also with c cigarettes and issues behind smoking. So I'm just wondering, what do you think uh, about the fact that smoking, especially in this country, seems to really have a lot of um, a lot of restriction? I don't know if you if you know, but here I guess the cigarettes are covered in a lot of um, images. Uh, I think it's maybe like 70% of the box or something with warnings and images uh, to deter people from actually opening that box and smoking it. But there doesn't seem to be anything about that on on food. Um, you go into McDonald's and you're not you know when you grab that big gulp, there isn't an image of an obese person or what their uh, stomach looks like. But there could be. I mean, I, <laughs> exactly. There really could be. I mean, of course, that's a great point. So I'm just wondering, what do you, what do you, and the fact that so many, um, you know, both the U.S. and and Canada have really gotten behind doing a lot of prevention against smoking, and there's so many restrictions, even with alcohol, there's so many restrictions as to where you can buy alcohol and how old you need to be, and and all that sort of stuff. But it doesn't seem like with food, there's there aren't any restrictions. I mean, at any age. You can walk into a McDonald's, whether you're two years old or you're 80 years old, and you can buy anything, and there's nothing, there are absolutely no restrictions whatsoever. Um, what do you think about that? I think it's pretty clear what we think about it, but um, <laughs> I will say this. I, again, I'm not an expert on Canada, but um, 
Neither of our countries is leading the world at this, at, at this point in anti-smoking. We started the anti-smoking campaigns, but neither of our countries is leading the world at this point. Australia has the most hideous cigarette packaging you've ever seen, and, they're, and they're, I believe they're turning it generic so that it'll just be warnings and no marketing on the package allowed. I will say, I, I will say that just yesterday, Mayor Bloomberg, our guy, said that he wants cigarettes in New York, State store, New York City stores to be kept under the counter, not on display. These are great things. When you make those kind of moves on, on foods that we know to not be good for you, foods that we know to not really be foods, you will see a decline in obesity, won't you? you yeah. see, and you do see that with cigarettes. That's right. Okay. So one last quick question. Yes, thank you for the nice conversation. A few weeks ago, there was a gentleman from San Diego, Jim something, Gavin, I think, and his talk was about the fiscal environment, which we really haven't talked tonight, and which I think will be an extra big chunk to add to the conversation and to the formula. Uh, for instance, uh, he demonstrated how the cities uh, and our environment are really not friendly to use as a pedestrian with the bicycles. And then you know, look here in Montreal, you can go for a drive-in uh, to buy coffee, uh, hamburgers, uh, parking spaces, you really, it's made for cars and not pedestrians. So all the designs of the city, it's just for cars. We used to have here in Montreal one day with no cars last year, which was a stupid idea to begin with, the way it was done. Uh, last year it was brought it uh, on, on an island. Can you imagine where usually there is no traffic or not much? So, I mean, uh, I've seen cities in Germany, for instance, where the downtown area, there was no car. There were a lot of people shopping because that's the idea of the city to have the shop open and have business. So, I mean, this is a, a major change. Uh, I was in China in 1980. The only overweight person was my guide because he would drive the car, not the bicycle. So I, I think this is something that we have to, uh, you know, uh, all the theories and all the studies and all the food and the psychology are important, but our physical environment uh, has a major role to play in our new lifestyle. So I don't know if you want to comment on that. So Mark, a, a last word about the obesogenic uh, environment, as the, the researchers like to call it. it how, how much of a contribution is that making to the problem? I actually, um, well, first I defer to Jennifer on this, but... Um, <laughs> It's got to be a factor, but uh, I think 40% I think of kids in New York are obese. So, um, and New York is the most walking friendly city in North America. So, I, I don't know how much of a factor. It has to be, you know, your common sense tells you it's a factor, but I don't know how much of a factor it is. It definitely plays a role. Uh, we could talk about walkability indices of a particular neighborhood. We look at things like the amount of green space that individuals have, their access to physical activity resources, and also the idea of just naturally how much physical activity you incorporate, so the things like commuting to work. And the cities with the lowest rates of obesity across Canada are, in fact, the most urban cities, Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal. And the idea is that part of that is, in fact, that we are walking a bit more um, to get places, and there may be more of that characteristics of the built environment that are playing a role. But it's not preventive. No, it's That's not. the key. That's right. That's right. Great. So uh, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. And just going to say a few words to wrap up. I'm going to remind you uh, about our next talk in the series. It's on April 18th, and the subject is going to be mental health in the workplace. Our guests uh, on April 18th will be Mary Deacon of Bell Canada. Bell Canada is given $50 million to mental health research. That's why she's been invited. She's writing the check. <laughs> and uh, she's going to be joined by Steve Harvey, the dean of the uh, Molson School of Business. And they're going to talk about this very important issue of, of mental health in the workplace. And then on May 1st, we're going to feature uh, uh, almost a modern miracle, a man called Ed Whitlock. He's the 82-year-old world marathon champion. Uh, he ran at age 82 a marathon in uh, three hours and 29 minutes. Uh, the marathoners among you will know that's impressive oh, so he at didn't about 20. Break three hours. No, no. He only did that at 70. <laughs> <laughs> he slowed down a little bit. He's slacking off. Uh, maybe if he starts eating better before six, there he'll get go. faster. <laughs> 
And uh, Ed Whitlock will be joined by Louis Barrere, director of the Perform Center, a really impressive uh, facility at uh, Concordia. If you haven't visited, you should do that too. And last reminder, uh, Mark, we're going to whisk him to the back uh, to sign books at the table. There's three of the books, as I mentioned, Food Matters, uh, How to Cook Everything and How to Cook Everything Vegetarian. So grab one and he'll uh, write you a little dedication. And last and not least, most importantly, please uh, join me in thanking Jennifer McGrath and Mark Bittman. And remember that it's after six, so you can eat whatever you want. Thank you. Nice work. Thank you.